I think it's safe to say that everybody, to some degree, procrastinates. If you type in how to stop procrastinating on YouTube, you'll likely get a bunch of videos ranging in the millions of views. And the techniques these videos talk about are often centered around time management, motivation issues, maybe bringing techniques like the Pomodoro technique and stuff like that. So if you've been struggling with this problem for a while, you've likely seen it all. But recently, we encountered a person with a very different view on this than what we've heard before. This person is Dr. Fushia Saroy from the University of Sheffield. We first encountered her when we came across an article that featured quite a lot of quotes from her where she talks about procrastination not as a time management or laziness or a motivation issue, but simply as a emotional self-regulation issue. I was so inspired by this article, I even made a content piece about it, which you can check out in the show notes. But I thought, in order to truly elaborate on this, in order to get a real grip on what it is that she's talking about and the research behind it, I thought we'd get her on the show, and that's exactly what we've done. So in this episode of the Acario podcast, Shane and I interview Dr. Fushia Saroy on the science of procrastination. So if you struggle with procrastination still, perfectionism or any other thing like it, you are going to want to watch this episode. The show notes can be found at acario.com forward slash 047. And with that, I hope you enjoy the episode. <laughs> Hello, welcome to the show. I'm really glad you could make it. And I'm really looking forward to, to talking to a real expert on, uh, on procrastination and productivity. <laughs> um, thanks for inviting me. And uh, yeah, I, I always, uh, I cringe a little bit when people say I'm an expert on, on procrastination, <laughs> because it sounds like I have a lot of personal experience. Um, yeah. But, yeah, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, you could interpret that as, oh, yeah, I'm an expert on procrastination, yeah. too. I do I'm sure it a lot. <laughs> lots of people out there who could say they're experts on procrastination. But yeah, I, so I, yeah, I, I qualify myself as an expert on, on uh, procrastination research. Right. That's OK. That's a good, that's a good note. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. So we have um, one of the reasons I'm excited to talk about this is because in our in the work that we've done with people. So, for example, we have a productivity online class that we do. And, and even before uh, I started Cario, I was working with entrepreneurs a lot. And the reason I ended up becoming so interested in, in procrastination is because this is basically, I, I was often led there. And I, I feel like especially, or at least from my perspective, when, when um, working with entrepreneurs and creative people, it seems that so often the core issue is actually procrastination. So it is, it is not that they don't know what to do. It is that they have a plan or that there is something they want to create, but they just find a thousand ways to not, you know, mm -hmm. not record that video, not write that article, not, not do the work. Right. So it often then becomes like, it starts out as, uh, you know, you're, you're trying to help someone with their business, but it ends up being, we have to solve this procrastination problem. And Let's maybe start by just like making sure we're talking about the right thing. Um, you know, in, in your mind, what is, what is a good definition of procrastination? Um, when are we procrastinating and when are we just taking a break? Okay, great question. I think it's an excellent place to start. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, as, as a researcher um, on procrastination and, and there's other researchers out in the field too, we try and come up with a, a definition of procrastination that will allow us when we're conducting our research to be able to know that actually what we're looking at is procrastination um, and not some other form of delay. And I think, so kind of, this is, it's a more of a technical definition, but it isn't really that technical. I think it's pretty understandable in some ways. Um, so, you know, procrastination is a form of delay, but it's not, it's not all forms of delay. In other words, you can delay something for good reasons um, but that's not necessarily procrastination. So to try and get around and, and distinguish and differentiate procrastination from other types of delay, um, we've come up with in the field, this sort of working definition, which is that um, procrastination is the um, voluntary and unnecessary delay. So it's a specific type of delay. So you, you put something aside voluntarily. It's not because your boss told you you've got to go do something else instead, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's unnecessary. 
So it's not because you have to go deal with an emergency, right? Or because it's, it's, it's a wise decision to put this project aside because you need more information before you can proceed, right? That would be a necessary delay. Mm. So it's unnecessary and voluntary delay, and it's of an intended task. So it's something that you intended to do. So there's volitional action there. You said, I'm going to do this. It's not someone told you to do it and you really don't want to do it, but mm. you have to do it. It's like you agreed to do it. Okay. So those are some, the three basic components, so unnecessary voluntary delay of an intended task. And this is where <laughs> procrastination kind of speaks to some, some of what you were just talking about with people just not getting on with things, even though they knew what they had to do. And you, you do this type of delay, despite knowing that there's going to be negative consequences for doing so either for yourself or for others. Right. Um, and I think that's a really key part of it too. So, because it, sometimes we delay things because we know it's wise to delay. We would call that a sagacious delay, right? It's important to put aside a project that you don't have all the information about before proceeding because to do so would waste a lot of time and resources. That's wise delay. That's not procrastination. Um, so all of these things together kind of paint a picture of procrastination as something that is inherently irrational, which is what you described at the beginning, right? That people just, you know, they know what to do. They've got all, it, it, they're all ready to go, but why aren't they actually getting on with it? It's yeah. irrational. It makes no sense. Yeah. And it's, it's one of those things that can be so frustrating um, to have this experience. And I, but it's such a human experience to, mm. to have this thing where it's like, I, I know what I want to do. I know why I'm doing it. It seems like I have everything is, it seems like all the ducks are in a row, except I'm just somehow not doing this. Right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. So, and I think that the way most people experience this is as a very like private and personal failure. Mm -hmm. So we set out to do something uh, and especially if it's something important, um, then we find ourselves procrastinating on that. And uh, let, me, let me know if this like, you know, tracks with what you have found in, in your research, <clears throat> it like starts, it starts with small delays, essentially, that's like, oh, I meant to do this today, but I guess I'll do it tomorrow. <clears throat> and, and we, we put it off. And we tell ourselves, on the one hand, we feel like, oh, it's, it's fine, I'll do it tomorrow. <clears throat> it's like, and we somehow believe that future me is gonna, is gonna be able to do this when I wasn't. Um, and, and we feel bad about it. And it kind of creeps up on us because we, we keep delaying and keep delaying and keep delaying. And essentially we then realize, oh my God, I've been putting this off for weeks or months, or I'm just totally stuck. And we feel like this is, there's something wrong with me, or this is just me being a failure. Mm -hmm. We tend to be very hard on ourselves about it. And also I think we are often um, like we, we want, we'd like to keep it a secret, right? We'd rather not tell people, hey, um, I just spent a week procrastinating on this thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and yeah, so that, that, that's, that's been my experience of like, it's, it's almost like this, this private secret, this private shameful secret that everybody feels like, oh my God, I'm the only one doing this. But actually everybody does it. That, that's how I've often seen it. Yeah, and I think that's, that's a fairly um, accurate, um, you know, representation of, of a lot of people's procrastination it takes other forms too i think you know the small tasks building up into something larger and kind of that's that sort of ongoing state of denial that that's even happening is is it can be quite common um you know it, it can take a lot of other forms too where there's people know they're procrastinating right from the beginning and then mm. the shame and the difficult feelings just build on that and um and then so the procrastination continues as well. And, and, and you're right, there are a lot of negative feelings around procrastination, but it, it, it's an interesting cycle because from our perspective, you know, there's been a lot of views out there as to why people procrastinate. You get the time management stuff and, you know, uh, laziness and all, all these myths around what the causes of procrastination or just you lack determination and motivation and self-control, right? Like you just don't have that strong enough will. It's that weakness of will or the akasya as the philosophers say. Um, but that's not actually the, what's underneath procrastination, right? Mm -hmm. So if you look at the sort of things that people procrastinate on, they're not fun things, right? They're not things that are immediately rewarding. They're things that are difficult, 
um, even ranging from, you know, minutely difficult and boring and just ugh, don't want to deal with that sort of those, you know, ick tasks, right? Um, to, or UG tasks, I think they, they call them, to the really anxiety provoking type tasks. So what's underlying and what's the, the initial cause of procrastination is an emotional reaction to a task, right? So that task is either something unpleasant to you, right? Or it brings up unpleasant feelings about your own competency, you know, your, uh, your ability to succeed in a certain area, um, your doubts about being able to achieve your goals, you know, past memories of difficult experiences with that task. There's a, there's a whole number of things that can come into play there. Um, and it's those emotions that are play. And that's exactly why then those feelings of, you know, you were saying you feel that, that sense of dread or that shame. We, we hide our, when we procrastinate. We're not proud of it. We have negative feelings about it. And that's why that can continue. So as you, you, you were describing there, you procrastinate on a little task and goes off and then you realize, oh, I really procrastinated. Those feelings of shame actually will maintain the procrastination. Um, and, it, you know, shame is a social emotion. It's something um, where we feel we've let others down, right? Um, guilt may be where we feel that we maybe have let um, ourselves down. So it's more of we feel like we've acted badly, right? But shame is where we can actually then take that feeling of um, guilt of acting badly to then that means I'm a bad person. And we've, we've linked this before in our research to, to social norms as well too, right? Like product productivity, right? So that what you were saying about, oh, I'm, you know, I'm, a, I'm ashamed that I procrastinated. We feel ashamed because we know that we're not being productive. We have such strong social norms, um, especially in Western culture and, and, and increasingly in, in Eastern cultures as well too, around productivity, right? And the more productive you are, the better a person you are, the more you're contributing to society, that your, your value, your worth as a person is almost measured in how productive you are. And so you have all these hyper productivity cult, like, you know, um, affirmations and things floating out there. And so if you don't produce because you're procrastinating, that you feel that shame. So it, it's, it's, it's connected to the, some of the, the um, beliefs and views and values we have around being productive. So naturally when you procrastinate, you're going to feel bad, but unfortunately that just feeds back in and makes you want to procrastinate more because now you realize that you're not maybe the, you know, most productive person. Yeah. So I think that th this is really fascinating. Um, and I think that the, the, the research that you've done has, really points at something that I think is, is a blind spot when it comes to this topic. And um, it's like Ollie made a video about this on our channel where he, where we kind of went through some of these ideas and we, we juxtapose it there where it seems like the, the common idea is, oh, if you have a productivity problem or procrastination problem, it's like, it's either a matter of, you know, you have to have a better system, you have to have a better way to manage your work or your tasks, or maybe it's a motivation problem or something like that. Um, and I think that this is like a, it, what, what you're talking about, like suggests that maybe we are, we are trying to apply the solution at the wrong end of this problem entirely. Because mm -hmm. if it's, if the, if the underlying cause somehow has to do with with an emotional response. So we're, we're afraid of something maybe, or um, yeah, there's some, let's say there's an, an emotional load that comes with this work that we're trying to do. And, and then the procrastinate, like that's why we procrastinate. And then the, the act of procrastinating somehow makes that worse. Can you elaborate on that? Like how, in what way does the, the feeling of shame about um, about not or about procrastinating essentially in what way does that make the problem worse well I mean it makes it worse immediately I guess if, if you start off that you were procrastinating not out of shame but because of some uncomfortable feeling around the task right mm -hmm. um, and so maybe doing that task would you were worried about the outcome maybe your promotion was riding on it maybe you know you didn't want to let others down maybe you were having doubts about your own capabilities because you were in a new post and this was a new task for you, whatever the reason, right? Or maybe the task was just something you don't enjoy doing. Okay, so you know we say procrastination is it has these this sort of emotion regu regulation or dysregulation at its core because 
you know, most of us, when we're faced with an unpleasant task, we muster up something inside of us. We find a different way to look at the task. We find a way to manage those emotions internally. But when we procrastinate, what we're in fact doing is we're uh, regulating those emotions externally. So you take that task, you put it aside. Now you don't have to think about it anymore. <sighs> You're immediately relieved of those negative emotions, right? Mm -hmm. So that's fine. So now the task is aside. And as you said, now you start to you, the realization, maybe you get a reminder, hey, have you written that report yet? <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, or when are you going to get around to doing X, right? Um, and those reminders, and there's been a bit of research on this too, to suggest those reminders do actually um, reignite those negative feelings in so much as they activate that shame. So now other people are aware that you're procrastinating. And even if they're not, you might, I mean, we're so almost programmed to think that we have to be productive, right? Like that's, it's a really deeply ingrained social norm. And so we know that we're transgressing that social norm, we're violating it when we procrastinate. So when we have that realization or whether it's somebody else reminding us or ourselves reminding us that, you know, we are, we, we should, should have gotten on with this a long time ago. We feel that that sense of shame because we have shame as a, a social emotion we experience when we transgress social norms. So we've transgressed that social norm of productivity. So now you add another layer of negative emotions onto those initial negative emotions that you had that made you procrastinate that task in the first place. And a lot of people will say, oh, guilt will drive you to do it. Yeah, for some people, guilt, feeling guilty about something can be a motivator. Some negative emotions can be a, be a motivator to get on with things. But if you're prone to procrastination or you're in the grips of a procrastinating on task, it doesn't work like that. Now you've layered over and you've actually dialed up those negative emotions that were driving you to run, you know, in, in the opposite direction of the task in the first place. So you're not going to get back to it. You're going to move further away from it. You're going to try and put it out of your mind again. And then when you're reminded again, the shame comes back and so on and so forth. And it can really amplify up to, um, to quite, um, you know, very intense feelings. And, and then they can bring on negative self-evaluations and self-loathing and, and all sorts of really un unpleasant, um, you know, emotional experiences, all from just starting off with a, putting aside a task. So it's like we are... And the, the way I'm, I'm kind of visualizing this, it's almost like there's an, an emotional charge to a task and we, we essentially keep charging it up with more negativity <laughs> the more we put it off and the worse we feel about having put it off and so on, right? That's right, yeah. And it's almost like it then becomes like this, this glowing hot ball of negative emotions <laughs> that you don't want to touch anymore. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so, so then the solution it's clear, right? It's not making people feel worse. And I think this is an important thing too, because if you know someone in your life that's procrastinating, we want it, we want to, you know, get on their case and go, come on, get on with it. Like you're really, you know, this is, this is causing me some difficulty that that's only going to make it worse. Right. So you, we have to diffuse those negative emotions, you know, yeah. like you said, that, that hot, you know, <laughs> blowing red ball or a bomb. Think of it as a, but a bomb ready to go off, right? Mm -hmm. Like the more you you add on to that, the more you're actually, um, you know, counting down that timer on that bomb ready to go off. And so you need to diffuse those negative emotions um, because that's yeah. the only way the per the individual is going to be able to get back and and be in a state where they can can manage. Put their focus on managing the behaviors. It, one of the things that happens when when we prioritize our managing our negative, our emotions. So managing these negative emotions, it, it's a very immediate response. So it's a sort of a prioritization of the short-term mood regulation, which is another way of how we phrase or sort of explain what goes on with procrastination. So we're, we're prioritizing managing those negative emotions now because they feel ominous, they feel heavy, they feel threatening. They're, we don't know how to deal with them except by procrastinating, right? So that offers different solutions then too. So we have to find other ways to manage those emotions. If we can get that out of the way, then we can get back to what really needs to be you know, regulated or managed, which is regulating our behavior and getting back to saying, right, this is the long-term consequences of me not taking or taking action right now. But we can't see any of that clearly when we're in the grips of those negative emotions, right? Because all we wanna do is manage those emotions now. And if we don't have a proper toolkit for managing these emotions, we will default to this external regulation of those emotions via procrastination and, and disengaging from that task. So what are the, what are things that like practically 
um, what have you found works for people? So if someone's essentially stuck in this in this procrastination procrastinating behavior, they have they have this something they're putting off that's heavily emotionally charged. What can we practically do to start diffusing this and and to start yet yeah, to essentially get to the point where this emotional regulation is no longer the main obstacle? Yes. No, it's a great question. I mean, there's there's a number of different approaches out there. Um, you know, some some researchers have been you know looking at sort of more therapeutic approaches like acceptance commitment therapy, which is more of a sort of a, a longer term solution. But there's even short term solutions you can use as well. Um, and, and I'm going to say there's also motion regulation training that can be done. There's been studies that looked at two weeks of motion regulation training and found that when people were trained to regulate their emotions, big surprise, the procrastination decreased, of course, because it's the emotions that are, that are driving it. But some of the research that um, I've done and that my PhD students have done have focused on um, not just diffusing those negative emotions, but actually trying to get the effective balance back into place, which means you know, dialing up positive emotions, mm. right? So dialing up positive emotions is one, one approach. And then there's another approach which I'll speak to in a moment, which does both that as well as dialing down negative emotions. So dialing up positive emotions can be finding something meaningful in the task. So often, you know, we're so stuck in that moment. So when we're in this sort of tunnel vision of those negative emotions, right? Because basically another way of looking at procrastination is it's, it's almost... It's, it's, it's very similar to the fight or flight response, right? Something's unpleasant, it's stressful, right? It activates that, that sort of very primitive fight or flight response, which flight or avoidance of that task is, is a form of that, right? So we don't know how to deal with it, so we, we disengage from it. Um, so to be able to see you know, what's going on with that task at a larger level is something we have to work a bit harder at because our brains are focused on the immediate. We have real cognitive changes that go on when we're stressed that focuses on the immediate threat. Immediate threat is these negative emotions. We need to be able to step back from that. And one way of doing that is, is sitting back and looking at that goal or that task and the more meaningful context in which it occurs. So if it's just writing a report, maybe you don't like writing reports, stepping back and going, actually this report means a lot to me because it means I can progress through you know, my career or I can demonstrate that you know the what I, the abilities that I've um, you know that I've done for the company over the last um, quarter or what have you. So you know whatever it is, just stepping back and seeing what the meaningfulness of that task is, and it can be at a, a more local level, but usually sort of a higher level thinking. Again, that's that's takes effort because our you know our minds are shifted towards thinking more concretely and more specifically when we're in in the, the grips of those emotions. Um, so. But doing that sort of reminder can work. And one of my PhD students, she, she uh, conducted um, CCN, she conducted a, an experiment where she had people reframe goals that they were struggling with and procrastinating on as being in a, a meaningful manner. And she compared that to a, just a neutral condition where they just talked about their goals and another condition where they just thought happy thoughts about the goals. Um, and what she found was quite fascinating. A couple of days later, when she followed up with them and had them chart the amount of time that they were procrastinating, she found that those who were given instructions to specifically reframe their goals from this broader, more meaningful perspective procrastinated less, right? So it kind of helped them show the bigger picture. It didn't make the negative feelings go away per se. It's, it, she had found some evidence that there was partly explained there was a reduction in negative feelings about the task. So you get this concurrent as you think more meaning, the negative feelings sort of drop into the background, right? So that's certainly one approach. Um, the other approach, though, that I think can be, um, you know, practiced, especially if you're really having a lot of negative emotions, is self-compassion. Um, and self-compassion is really important for both getting, you know, balancing and, and dialing down those negative feelings as well as dialing up the positive feelings and, and getting back to a position where, um, you know, you, you can see beyond just trying to manage those emotions. It is, it is you can think of it as, a, as an emotion regulation strategy or sort of a way of reappraising um, situations. And, and it's just as it sounds, it's, it's exp expressing um, compassion towards yourself the same as you would to other individuals. Um, the model that we use um, in our research is the one by Kristen Neff. And, has, and she looks at self-compassion as having these three components. So the first is 
expressing self-kindness versus self-criticism and self-judgment, which of course, if you're procrastinating, right, you're judging yourself, right? And you're being hard on yourself and, and counterintuitively saying, hey, I'm not going to be so hard on myself for this. It's, some, it's hard for some people to do that, but it's effective. The other is common humanity, which is, I think, as you, you mentioned earlier, Shane, that people, you know, you, you get caught in this thing thinking I'm the only one procrastinating and you get trapped in that shame loop because you don't want to tell anybody. You don't want to reach out for help, right? Because that would make you feel even worse. So you, we get caught in sort of a feeling of isolation, like we're the only ones that have ever procrastinated rather than recognizing this is a really, really common thing. Everyone is procrastinating at some point. A lot of people are procrastinating right now. It doesn't make it okay, but it means that, you know, you can, you're not the only one. It's not, there's not something special. Something uniquely wrong with you. Yeah, exactly. There's not something uniquely wrong with you. You just, it's just part of being human. So get on with it. Right. So, um, and that can, that can drive away the self-pity too. Right. And that's, mm-hmm. that's where the mindfulness component comes in because when we're feeling negative, we get immersed, we, we, we become fused with those negative emotions. We become that shame, become that guilt, we become that self-loathing, you know, rather than seeing it as just an you know, an emotional experience that really in our brains only lasts a few seconds and we keep it going by reinvigorating it and, and rehashing it and ruminating in it and et cetera. Um, and that can all turn very quickly, especially if you're feeling isolated into feelings of self-pity. Um, whereas mindfulness in, in the context of self-compassion is about having a balance. It's not ignoring the negative. It's, you know, a lot of people think it's a very Pollyannish kind of thing where you just like, oh, everything's okay. It's great. I procrastinated. No, no, it's not like that at all. Yeah. You feel bad did you procrastinate own that right but own also the you know the positive side of things here which is like yeah i can do better i can get yeah. past this i can get on i can get on with things and and yeah. that's why the research has shown that people who have this self-compassion they actually are more motivated mm. which is it's strangely counterintuitive right we, we feel like if if i forgive myself for this then i'll just do it again or something like that but it, it turns out it's not like that. And I wonder, like, I'm, I'm hearing some parallels to uh, something that, Ollie, you've been talking a lot about um, kind of radical honesty recently. And I, I wonder if there's some, because I'm hearing some of the things that I heard in your last conversation about radical honesty, where it's like the ability to face and even disclose what is really going on can maybe help with this, right? So instead of it just being like this private shame, if you can admit to yourself, yes, I'm procrastinating. Yes, I feel bad about this. It maybe also tell someone else, yeah, I've been procrastinating on this. And the reason I haven't done it, you know? Uh, do, do you see what I, what I mean here? It's, it sounds kind of similar. Yeah, I do. I, I get it. And that's it. That's one of the things I love about uh, Brene Brown's work on, on shame is that she calls it the shame closet, doesn't she? It's like everything that's in the shame closet, the more that stuff stays in the closet and is in the dark, it kind of grows and mutates in the closet. So that's why um, that's, that's why with the courses that we run, Shane, like with focus and action and stuff, I've heard a few times now that one of the benefits that people get when they run through it is they get to talk to other people and relate to other people about their procrastination issues. Because mm-hmm. obviously we, we get a lot of guys, um, a lot of people who are you know, running their own business and that can naturally be quite a, that's like a solo endeavor for a lot of them. So privately they're, they're experiencing procrastination and then shame around it. And then they're seeing Instagram and Facebook and all these entrepreneurs with like Lamborghinis and all this other bullshit. And then they're like, oh, wow, these people are getting, these are just swarms of people that are getting shit done. And meanwhile, I'm struggling to, you know, write the first sentence of my ebook I said I was going to write three months ago. So, but when they come out and, and start talking to people about and relating to other people about this, this procrastination and this and perfectionism and all the rest of it, all the stuff that comes with it. Yeah, I've, I've had a few people mention now that that's one of the most valuable parts of the courses that we run is that there's a community-based aspect to it. And I think, yeah, I think you're right. I think the fact that people just take all this, take the procrastination out of the shame closet, expose it to the light by talking to people about it and instill a sense of common humanity, which as you mentioned, um, was a, an aspect of self-compassion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's total parallels and the radical honesty thing. Yeah, it's just, that's just a channel. That's just a way of bringing things mm-hmm. out of the shame closet into the open. And uh, we could even dive deeper into that in the future as well, because like I procrastinate 
and I feel shitty about that. And I, and the thoughts I'm having are, I'm never going to get this thing done, or I'm so I'm you know everyone else is getting stuff done and I'm not. And we can really sort of dive into it and bring it out. Uh, yeah, there's potential for that, but I see I do see parallels for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah there's I mean definitely that I mean. The, these what they call procrastinatory cognitions like why didn't I start sooner what's wrong with me like these are common and you know I think one of the great things about that and communicating that you know that radical honesty you're talking about Ollie is is that again it you you'd be surprised at how many people are having the same sorts of thoughts that you are they're not unique to you that this is what we all experience we all go through um, and that means that collectively we can help each other though, too. So sometimes it can be about sharing tips and things that work for them, um, but even more practically, right? So a, a lot of times people procrastinate on things because they're unsure. Uncertainty and anxiety is aversive, right? So people procrastinate when the task is aversive or invokes aversive states. Mm -hmm. We don't like uncertainty. We like to be in control. We like to have things to be predictable. So when we're working on something where there's a lack of structure, we don't have enough information. We've got a lot of anxiety around it because we've never done it before. Maybe, maybe it's just a newbie thing, right? Mm -hmm. And then we're feeling we procrastinate. We have that shame. Like you said, we're locked into that. You've got that shame closet and, and it's all stuck in there. And really though, if you come out and talk to people, you can get some practical solutions. It's not about your procrastination, but maybe you can find out that, hey, I don't know how to do this particular task. I've never done this before. That's why I'm putting things off. And you go, oh, wait, here's a perfect guide over here. And then you've got that information and that's it. So now all of a sudden that negative emotion that was you know, causing you to procrastinate in the first place is gone. You've, you've removed that uncertainty, but you can never get to that point where you're reaching out for help and for social support if you've experienced that shame. And, and some of the other research that I've done and my, my students have done have shown that indeed people who are prone to procrastination have a harder time either seeing support or reaching out for that support in their environment. And, and this has everything to do with that shame again. And like you said, and not, not being open and honest about what's going on with them. Yeah, it, it's, it, it's really interesting. And, and so what I'm like to just like briefly summarize how this is kind of coming together for me is that a, a good reframe for this could be that if someone is procrastinating is to realize that the, I like this as a principle. I like this idea that the obstacle to your task is your task. So if I, I have this task and I keep procrastinating on it, and at some point I have to say, okay, the real, my, my high priority task is no longer writing this report. It is dealing with this procrastination problem because that's my obstacle to the task. Mm -hmm. And if we, if we can think of it, okay, so I have this there's this emotional charge that's happening here. I feel terrible about it. The longer I put it off, the worse it gets. And my priority has to become diffusing this emotional charge. And I can do that by practicing self-compassion, by, um, by forgiving myself, by seeking support, like you just mentioned. All these things will essentially diffuse that bomb, make that whole thing feel a lot less dangerous and that will put me in a position where now I can go back to actually writing the report instead of just running scared from this uh, emotional disaster that's building up, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you know, and, and there's a threshold effect there too, and it's different for different people, right? So sometimes you only need to you know practice enough of that you know, self compassion or support to just get those negative emotions down to a threshold where you can manage them because we all mm. have the capacity to manage negative emotions, right? This is not something that we don't know how to do. I mean, often it's learned in childhood and some of us have better models than others for that, or we've had more experiences to, to manage those um, negative emotions than others have. But, you know, so everyone's, we've got a different threshold. So if you get that down to your threshold, we're now, okay, yeah, I still feel a bit uncomfortable. I'm still a bit nervous about this, but you know what? I can handle it. I've got this. Then you can move forward. Um, and again, it's, it's going to be different for everyone. So it's knowing also where that threshold is for you in terms of those negative emotions. It's not about, like you don't want to get into a state where it's like, oh, I got to get rid of all the negative emotions around that task, right? Because that's not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, um, I really like that. But so it's it's not the idea, isn't that we only do things that are easy and effortless, <laughs> but you just get it to the point where you where you can handle it. I really like that. Yeah. Yeah, where you can manage and knowing where that threshold is. And sometimes you can remember, like some, you know, what's often 
what happens with a lot with, with people prone to procrastination is they, they have a low sense of self-efficacy. So they have low confidence and competence in their abilities, especially mm. to handle difficult things. Um, but we've all gotten through things in the past and sometimes we quickly forget these. So mm. another thing is if you're, you're struggling with something is to remind yourself of when you had a difficult task before and how did you get through it? What did you do? And were you successful? And because what we know is that when people, when we're reminded of those successes, when we have an experience of success, it builds our self-efficacy. If we focus just on the failure, then that's, that's where we'll end up. So sometimes it is good to draw upon past examples where we have struggled through something and come out the other end on top of things. Um, and just to remind ourselves that, yeah, I can get through this. Because that, that also is an important ingredient too, to sort of being able to get yourself to that point where you can say, yeah, it's still uncomfortable, but yeah, I, I can handle this. We have to remind ourselves that we can handle it. And that's, that's the point where you know where your threshold is too. That's great, yeah. So I have, I have one more challenge for you that I wonder what your take on is. And this, again, this comes from just our experience um, of working with people I don't know if this is like a typical entrepreneur thing, or maybe maybe everyone has this, but but I can tell you for sure for among entrepreneurs, this is very common. Is that one of the problems they will have is that there's just too many things. <laughs> so where it's like, okay, so I'm I'm doing all the stuff we talked about in order to overcome the procrastination on this project. But as I'm doing that, there's like 15 other things that I also supposed to, you know, you talked about the reminder, you know, have you done that report? It's like, they're so inundated with that. Oh, but have you, have you done this? Have you done that? Have you finished this? Have you finished that? It's just like, there's so much going on. They feel like even if I successfully overcome my procrastination over here and I manage to be more productive over here, there are all these other fires burning and it's, I'm just like in a state of panic <laughs> about, <laughs> you know, it's being like sent in so many different directions in a way, right? Um, is that something you've encountered as well? Do you have anything to, to, to say about this specific situation, this specific problem? <laughs> well, I, I can personally um, identify with that situation, even as, as an academic, you know, we've all, um, always got lots of ideas and, and lots of demands and, and, and different things that need to need to be done. Um, so uh, yeah, I think, I think the issue there is really about focus and meaning. Um, I would say, you know, and, and this is where bringing that sort of meaningfulness framework back into our goals and our tasks and can not only help with the procrastination, but it can keep you focused on what's really important too, right? And so if we just, if we're running around looking at things as tasks, as little bits and pieces that are disconnected, but that collectively feel like a weight on us because we're not getting them done. And then if you're already procrastinating or if you're sensitive to the fact that you're prone to procrastination, the weight of those things can start tipping over to making you feel like, oh, here I'm procrastinating again because I'm not getting those things done. That's not actually an accurate, you know, representation of what's happening in that particular scenario. If you're, in, you know, inundated with a lot of things and you're going to, unable to get to them, um, that's not, you know, it may not be because you're procrastinating, maybe because you're overcommitted, right? Um, mm -hmm. So that's one, one solution is to kind of cut back and, and focus the commitments. The other is also to sort of, I think, chunk those you know, numerous things together and say, okay, which of these are really important right now for my larger goals? What are, you know, keeping focused on goals. We can't, if we run our days just responding, you know, constantly putting out fires and responding to things, we don't get things done, right? Yeah. Not really. We don't get our goals done. We need to have that focus. We need to have structure, right? And we are more going to be more prone to procrastination. We know people are more prone to procrastination, not only on tasks that are, that, um, are aversive, but tasks that lack structure because mm -hmm. there's no focus, so we need to give ourselves that focus and say, right, this is the thing that's most important to me right now. So for my business, this is the thing I have to focus on. This other stuff is just like, you know, flies, you know, in the background, just bite it out of the way, right? It, it can wait, right? So there you're making it, you're, you're, you know, you're making a, a decision to say, I'm not going to do those things right now. These other things that are important to me and those things can wait. And immediately now you've taken control, but what you've also done is you set up the circumstances where you're not going to feel like you're procrastinating because you haven't intended to do those things. Now you've actually made an intention to say those things can wait. They're not important. I'm not putting them off because I don't want to do them. I'm putting them aside 
because the thing that I need to focus on are this set of tasks here, because this is more aligned with my, my key goals right now. Yeah, no, I, I really like that because I think that it does often also come down to like, you have to stand your ground about it too, where you say, mm -hmm. this is important. This other stuff is less important. And, and often it also involves like being able to say no to other people. Yeah. If someone comes oh, can you help me with this? You just have to say, I'm sorry, but no, because I, <laughs> there's already too much. And I know where my priorities lie. And I know that if I say yes to this, it's just going to make everything worse. So, yeah. and maybe that also has to do with like the discomfort, you know, it's uncomfortable to say no to someone, but to realize like the discomfort of saying no to this person now and staying on track uh, on my priorities is, is, uh, is much better mm -hmm. than it's, it's, I'd rather deal with that than with the discomfort of the consequences of saying yes to everything. And then, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and when you, you know, when you say yes to something, you're having to say no to something else that may be really important to you. So what you're doing now is you're eroding mm -hmm. your own goals um, and, you know, in eroding those things that are important to you. Um, and, and also eroding your confidence and be able to get things done because if you've got too many things on the go, then you're not going to be able to have as much time to actually finish things and then get that sense of confidence, um, you know, that you can actually do that so that can feed into things as well but i think also the issue of saying no you know people who have difficulties with self-esteem have difficulty saying no yeah. um you know it's you, we want to we think we have to please other people that we think that our worth is is tied up somehow to making other people happy um and in the end of the day you know we have to make ourselves happy right first and foremost, by getting the things done that we need to get done, which may help others in the end. I think that's, that's you know, we have to play it for the long game, right? It's not just the short game is, oh, I'll help this person now and I'll make them happy, but I'm putting aside my goals. And if, if me, you know, completing this part of my project means that, you know, I can get it done and this project has implications that will help a lot of people, right? Then you actually aren't helping people in the end, right? You have to play that long game on it, and sometimes it's hard to see that pers that perspective as well. That's a kind of thinking about future you, sort of tied in into the whole picture there as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is great. So I, I'm I'm really glad that you um, that you are bringing this perspective um, because, like I said, I, th I think this is often missing, right? That the things that we try to apply where we, we're like, oh, I have, to, I have to be more disciplined. I have to be more, I don't know, I just have to be stronger or better or something like that. That's the solution to, to procrastination. I think that that's somehow where we tend to go, where, where that seems to be the, the solution that we intuitively reach for. It's like, just be better, just try harder. And it's just, I think it's really, really valuable that you're with this research, you're bringing this perspective that is, Kind of counterintuitive but i think incredibly important so i'm really grateful for that um is there is there anything else that you would like to let our audience know about i know that um, in our uh, pre-recording discussion you mentioned that there's a book in the works um is there anything else that you know where can people find out more about you and your work and is there anything else that you'd like our audience to know about yeah um, yeah, sure. So I, I, I have finished um, a book. It's sort of in its final stages of, um, you know, being reviewed and, and finalized. And we're just looking at titles and covers and that type of thing. It's going to be um, released, I believe, next year under the um, American Psychological Association, so APA Life Tools series. So they have a series of self-help books mm -hmm. that are written by um, academics and, and experts in the field that, um, you know, give sort of not just background, but also a lot of tools. So there's all kinds of exercises in each chapter to help people work through identifying the emotions, identifying, I've got a whole section on there on work procrastination as well too, um, on, on sort of a flow chart to understand when your break is actually turning into procrastination. So how you can check mm. yourself. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, that's gonna be coming out. And, and I've also recorded um, an audio book um, on procrastination. I think that, I think, that, remember the title is, uh, just do it. <laughs> and, um, that's, uh, that was with Noble and it's, uh, being picked up by Audible. And again, that look for that to come out, um, either later this year, or early in 2022. That's great stuff. Yeah. I can't wait. This is the kind of stuff that I uh, love to devour <laughs> as much as possible. <laughs> I love to learn more about this. So I'm definitely going to be on the lookout. 
Yeah, so thank you very much for your time and for sharing this with us. This, is, this has been a great conversation. Thank you very much. John, thanks, thanks for inviting me. I'd love, love to talk about procrastination and, and hopefully this will um, give some insights to help some of your listeners deal with their mm. procrastination and don't be hard on yourselves. Everyone does it, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, this is definitely, this is definitely helpful. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks.